Hi everyone, thanks for listening to my presentations. Today I'll be talking about kidney stones treatment and I'll be going through the general approach. Sit back. If you haven't listened to kidney stones lesson one, please do. Here I've covered the symptoms, the risk factors, the different types of stones, and the probable causes. But today I'll be limiting myself to how to make a diagnosis and treatment medically and surgically. Sit back, let's go. The laboratory investigation when it comes to kidney stones will include complete blood count. Particularly, you will be having a clue that you are dealing with strobile stones when you are thinking of kidney stones and you have increased white blood cell count because strobile stones is from urinary tract infection. Then you have blood urea nitrogen and creatinine done. You have your analysis where you're going to likely find the stones if it is expelled and all sorts of crystals. Now we analyze whether there is high pH, or whether there is glucose, anything, just cystinuria, uh, calcinuria, everything, osaluria could be done through analysis. And of course, we have electrolytes to know the level of potassium, sodium, phosphate, and calcium. For a thyroid hormone releasing hormone, we want to know what is happening to parathyroid gland. We were dealing with hyperparathyroidism, releasing lots of calcium to circulate the system or not. And we don't we need to know the pH because acidic pH or alkaline pH are not welcome. Acidic pH will give us urea acid stones and alkaline pH will lead to calcium phosphate stone formation. And of course pregnancy test because you are going to deal with a woman of childbearing age that is pregnant differently. The imaging techniques here will be CT scan mainly. So you can use low dose CT or non contrast CT, ultrasonography if there's pregnancy mostly, kidney, urethra, and bladder plain film x ray, and magnetic resonance imaging if it's available. Still on imaging, you may start with plain x-ray of the kidney, retina, and bladder, particularly in many parts of the world. CT is the best, however, if you can afford it or if it is readily available in your jurisdiction. But remember, CT is not as common as x-ray. Opacity will determine what we're going to use as imaging if we have the options. So 90% or more are X ray radio opaque on plain film X ray, but uric acid is not. Uric acid is radio lucent on X ray. CT scan can detect all storms except one except in the nerve in anyone taking in the nerve for example in hiv the in the nerve stones are not detectable via ct scanning so remember i said just a while ago that ct scanning is the best because it's going to detect all storms except one ultrasonography is useful particularly in pregnant women. It's also useful in cases of people that are allergic to IV contrast. And ultrasonography can pick uric acid stones and calcium stones. It detects adrenophrosis as well, but the overlying gas can make retro stones very difficult. The algorithm for the management is essentially that you might be dealing with a symptomatic situation. Then you advise and educate, and of course, you embark on preventive measures. 
So there is possibility of emergency intervention when it comes to kidney stones if you are faced with sepsis and kidney stone. If you are faced with bilateral obstruction or acute kidney injury, or you are dealing with solitary kidney in the face of obstruction, then the treatment here will be decompression by percutaneous drainage and urethra stenting. You give your intravenous antibiotics, intravenous analgesis, intravenous antiemetics. The definitive management will start after sepsis resolution. In severe cases, please just admit. Give your moving intravenously, subcutaneously, or intramuscularly. Give your IV fluid, rhyme microscopy culture and sensitivity test done, but you can commence empirical antibiotics before the susceptibility results will be released. Change to the definitive or appropriate antibiotics once the results are out. Treatment generally depends on certain factors. The size of the stone, the smaller ones that could be expelled, don't bother about it, but I'll go into details of that in a bit. The location, some in the retrial, some in the retropelvic junction, some in the calyces, so it depends on where they are. The severity of the symptoms, like I've just gone through the emergency situations where you need to ask fast, and other situations where you need to admit immediately. But we're going to come across a situation where you're just going to send home. Then health status of the patient. The way you're going to deal with debilitated person and pregnant woman is not the same way you're going to deal with a young man with mild symptom. If a symptomatic storm on CT accidentally discovered, then we ask ourselves, where is it located? What's the size? Can treatment be given if symptomatic later on? Because sometimes you are in the rural area, right? Or somebody, you are in the city, somebody has come from the rural area where there are no doctors, maybe you just have somebody to help you know, drive them down and make that determination whether they're going to treat right now or you do nothing. You're going to send this patient home if the stone is less than 10 millimeters and you are dealing with less severe or just mild symptoms, no vomiting, or you are sure the individual can administer an analgesis and the person will truly increase fluid intake. Then give Tanalon or Paracetamol, depending on where you are, on the surface of the air with or without ibuprofen, Advil or Martin, depending on where you are, Thamsulosine to increase stone passage. And please, strain while urinating. Educate the patient that, that they should strain while urinating. So, I won't admit, if I'm dealing with all these situations, let me recap in one minute. If the stone is less than 10 millimeters, less severe symptoms or very mild, good patient that is not debilitating and not vomiting. The patient can administer you know, painkillers on herself and you know, by himself. Or I'm pretty sure this person will increase fluid intake because he or she is not vomiting. I'll just prescribe Tamalon and ibuprofen. It might be paracetamol and ibuprofen, depending on where you are. And I'll prescribe tamsulosine also to increase stone passage. And I'll encourage or educate the patient to please train while urinating. And to not urinate in the washroom, urinate in the bowl so that, or in a party, so that we'll see the stones when they're out. If it's symptomatic, we do non contrast CT. We'll take care of the pain, come through, 
We treat our shit infections. We give out her matches. If it's less than 10 millimeters, we're going to observe an increased fluid intake, increased training, increased alpha burger agent. If stone passes, then we're going to treat the underlying cause of causes. Conservative management. Conservative management is preferred before shock wave neutrotripsy or retroscopy or percutaneous nephrotostomy or open surgery. No dissolution of the already formed cushion stones will lead to surgery. Okay? But if the stones are 5 millimeters or less, that will pass spontaneously. 90% of those that are less than 5 millimeters will spontaneously pass. 50% of those between 5 millimeters to 10 millimeters will spontaneously pass. Any stone that is above 10 millimeters can never pass spontaneously. Proximal retro stones are less likely to pass spontaneously. That's why I said earlier that the position and the size of the storm and the type of symptoms will determine what you do. You can be waiting and watching for about two to three weeks before the storm will pass. So the medical intervention that is a form of prevention here is you embark on medical therapy. You should treat all the treatable causes and prevent formation of storms in about 90% of cases. And how are we going to do that? Because we don't want the already formed storm to increase in size. So we'll continue to educate and hammer it to the ears of the patient. Increase your fluid intake. Decrease protein intake this time. Decrease salt intake, please. Take normal calcium intake because if you take less calcium, there will be increased urinary oxalate excretion. Hence, you will have stone formation and a negative calcium balance. Decrease your oxalate by decreasing spinach, rubber, chocolate, and nuts. Cranberry juice can increase your citrus excretion, leading to increased stones. Cranberry will decrease oxalate and then leading to calcium phosphate stones. If you are dealing with cystine stones, we can give potassium citrate to alkalinize. We can give deep penicillin. We can also give alpha acaptopropinoglycin, MPG. If you are dealing with stroophyte stones, we have to treat the source that is the urinary tract infection, we can add acetohydrozamic acid, a kind of raised inhibitor. If we are dealing with low citrates, then we'll keep potassium citrates. With that, we'll be alkalinizing the urine and we'll then dissolve the stones and prevent calcium and lead acid stones. If you are dealing with high oxalates, you can give pyridoxine. Calcium will initially decrease urinary oxalate, but when we place the patient on calcium for a long term, then effects may be increased calcium level. Cholesterol is good to decrease the absorption of oxalate and probable increase of oxalopactor fumigants degrade the oxalate and prevent oxalate stones. Thalzides will be useful to reduce the urine calcium levels and increase blood calcium because thalzide will give us low calcium and give us more calcemia. So hypercalcemia, high level of calcium in the blood is the situation and less in the urine is the situation with tarzite. That is why some will use tarzite in the face of osteoporosis. Decreased urinary calcium will decrease tone development in the kidney. 
to decrease uricemia or leukosuria, you can use allopurinol, potassium citrate, and verbosostat. Somebody familiar with gout will remember this. In the face of apacalcuria, we can use tarsite. Tarsite will lead to apacalcemia by increasing tubular reabsorption of calcium and decreasing apacalcuria. We can prevent apokalemia by adding potassium citrate. Potassium magnesium, if you are dealing with decreased magnesium citrate. Potassium phosphate will suppress calcitriol synthesis and thereby decreasing the calcium absorption. We can give oral potassium citrate to increase pH and citrate excretion in your rind if it is increased. The non-medical interventions will begin by having CT ultrasound or plain x-ray done. The CT or ultrasound will reveal sepsis and we have to refer immediately to nephrologist or urologist. If the stone is greater than 10 millimeters, then we we'll start thinking of extracorpora shockwave lithotripsy. Surgical intervention. Surgical intervention will be necessary in 10 to 20 percent of cases. That will be determined by the type of symptoms, the size of the stones, the location, the pain severity. Prosima uretra stones, the large stones, and effective provides stones. We have moved from medical intervention to surgical intervention right now. And in surgical units, when it comes to kidney stones, the first thing to think of will be shockwave lithotripsy. Some people call it extracorpora shockwave lithotripsy. And what are the characteristics of the stone and the patient before we back on this? Number one, it must not be large stones because shockwave lithotripsy is not good for large stones. Two, it is useful when the stones are not greater than 1.5 cm in diameter. Three, the stone should be visible with an X-ray monitor. Four, it's not good for obese people because it will have complex renal anatomy. Five, shockwave lithotripsy or shakopura shockwave lithotripsy is contraindicated in those on anticoagulant. So we need to take that history from the patient. Six, shockwave lithotripsy uses an energy shockwave, just like the name implies. And that is transmitted through water onto a kidney stone. And then the high energy will fragment the stones. What are the possible complications or side effects? There may be incomplete stone fragmentation. And with that, there's possibility of urinary tract obstruction from the incomplete stone fragmentation that I've just mentioned. There may be renal parikama injury and leading to decreased glomerular filtration rate. Some patients cannot take it because it could increase the blood pressure. So the patient that are hypertensive might not be able to take this. It may damage the spine, you know, DNA, particularly for the younger age group who are still you know, expectant to become fathers. And that will lead to temporary no decline in fertility. So many people will be able to cope with that, but when it damages the DNA of the span, that won't be encouraging. So for younger people, young men of 20 and 30, they won't want to take this. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy or PNL is useful when the stone is greater than two centimeters in diameter useful in stone calcula, cystine stones, 
because they are resistance to shock with the trips. Better note that if the diagnosis is resistance storms from onset, let the patient have the mind prepared towards PNL. Uteropathy function obstruction will warrant the use of PNL. Horseshoes kidneys. Remember when I said the possible risk factors for kidney stones in my first presentation that abdominal anatomy of the kidney. So horseshoe kidneys. Stones with chalicea da verticula will need percutaneous nephrototomy. What are the possible complications here? You might be dealing with fever, infections, lower stone free rates, longer operative times, longer hospital stays, chalicea stones will likely have more complications than the pelvic stones. Retroscopy. Retroscopy is useful for middle and distal retra stones. Also useful with prosthema retra and intrarenal calcula, but more for the middle and distal retra stones. It's also used if there's failed extracorporeal shock wave to trypsin. It is either with rigid retroscopy or flexible retroscopy. Stents are placed after seeing everything that is wrong. So after a retroscopy, then there will be stents in situ. Open surgery for stone. Open surgery for stone is less required nowadays. It is meant for complex renal calculi or complex retinal calculi. Also for stronger calculi, APNL won't survive. Patients with complex renal or retinal anatomy or in morbid obesity. And with that, I've come to the end of various interventions when it comes to kidney stones treatments. Both do nothing, to do something, to admit, to emergency, to advise, to go home, and to surgery. The next presentation will be all about stone prevention in kidney, kidney stone prevention. Thanks for listening. Please remember to share and subscribe. I appreciate it.